on this week's episode, we're no doubt about to spend 25 minutes talking about lap one and then 25 seconds talking about the rest of the race. So let's do it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Back to the Grid. I'm your host this week, Tom, and I'm joined by Chris. Evening. And Stu. Hello. Hello, gentlemen. Um, I mean, I've already alluded to it in that very quick and witty intro, but um, (laughs) not a very exciting Monaco Grand Prix, really, was it? I mean, some very nice news, but probably one of the most dull Monaco GPs in a while. Ever? Maybe mm, ever. I, don't I know. think the fact so, that they, so the, the <laughs> fact that they're not even going fast, <laughs> is like kind yeah. of a bit of a problem. Like that does make it look a lot less yeah. exciting. Like I was saying last week, I like my favorite thing about the Monaco Grand Prix. Yeah, you really get a sense of the speed of the cars, and I think like this race, even though I only watched the thirty minutes highlights, which was in of itself Pointless. dull as hell. <laughs> They they did not look fast. You could visibly then, see no. them going slowly, like compared to compared to obviously qualifying. They were like eleven yeah. seconds slower a lap on average. Like absolutely, even for race pace, that's a crazy crazy difference. It average. was, <laughs> yeah. Like the the timing of the red flag was the worst possible point to have it because it just yeah. meant everybody swapped tires and then drove to the end and like. Yep sure the guys that started on hards and had to do mediums for the whole race had a bit more of a challenge but even then like it wasn't really an issue was it yeah the pace was low enough that it wasn't ever a problem i think it tells you everything when the most excited that the at least the f1 tv commentary team got was trying to work out if there's ever been a race during mandatory pit stops or, or any or even any era where there was literally no pit stops whatsoever because everyone had like changed during a red flag Mm, and i think they went back to it was turkey a couple of years ago where there was like one pit stop because obviously it was an intermediate race from like start to finish and pretty much everyone stayed on them and like one person changed i can't remember who it was and then they started like going and then before that it was probably mika in 93 and i'm like <laughs> is this is this the most exciting this is like information the, yeah, we've that's got that's right the now. chat that you get in <laughs> friday practice or no saturday morning fp3 <clears throat> that's yeah. the level of chat it's like yeah. or like test pre-season match. testing however yeah. this was this was red flag chat basically that's that's oh, where red flag, okay to. well that can be forgiven <clears throat> i think yeah. it was red flag chat another another big giveaway for how bad it was was when alex jakes had to literally had to check mm-hmm. himself as he was saying uh, i think it was when stroll pitted and this even made the highlights he uh he said something like something's happening <laughs> in the pit like cause yeah. he realized like what he'd done and he's like oh i'm gonna get fired <clears throat> if i end that sentence there i better carry on <laughs> um yeah just absolutely something obviously something needs to change i'm sure we'll get to that at some point um yeah, yeah. i mean We can do it now, like we can jump ahead to that discussion. I mean, I think there's two discussions to have. One is the one we've had many times before, which is why do tyre changes under the red flag count as a tyre change to fulfil the rules? Because every time this happens, it leads to a really boring race. Because like the one interesting thing, particularly about Monaco, is that everyone's got to come in and make a pit stop and there's strategy around whether you go first or wait for others like it's immense pressure on the pit crew because that makes or breaks your race and even that was gone like it was literally just a procession yeah um and then layered on top of that is just the fact that they can't overtake like yeah you know we even had verstappen on fresh tires caught up you know he caught up like 15 or 20 seconds to the back of russell who was on like ancient mediums yeah Yeah. over the course of not many laps as well yeah i think he took like five or six seconds out of him in a single lap at one point and then just couldn't do anything about it because you just can't overtake there so yeah Yeah. i mean did you see um verstappen and russell like chatting in the interview pen after the race no 
Yeah. I... Verstapp- <clears throat> Verstappen was just like, my God, that was boring. And Russell uh, walks yeah. over and he was like, that was terrible. I think Verstappen said something like, we're all going to go for a run now because that was no work for us whatsoever. We all <laughs> need to build up a sweat by going for a run. <clears throat> I did hear yeah. the radio back to the pit wall, I think, at one point, um, along the lines of, I should have brought a pillow. This yeah. is just so boring or, or something to that effect. <laughs> Yeah, I mean they <clears throat> they both suggested only semi jokingly, and I know Hamilton has suggested this before, just like mandate that Monaco is a minimum two stop race. Yeah, I mean I don't really like the idea of like <clears throat> mandating a particular number stop number of stops. I would prefer it if they just brought a specific Monaco tire, like a really yeah. soft tire that like forced a... them to stop. Because mm. then at least then you've got the strategy of trying to make the tyre last if you yeah. can but knowing you know that it being obviously much much more difficult to <clears> make that tyre last which is why obviously no one ran that tyre in the race because it wasn't a viable strategy against the the two harder compounds yeah but if everyone only had soft tyres then i think that would be that would make a more interesting race and mm. the fact that you know there is there are provisions in the rules for monaco to be an outlier to be different for example Monaco, yeah. I think, only has to run two hundred. I think it's about two hundred eighty kilometers long of yeah, racing, it's not and every literally every distance. other track has to be like three hundred five kilometers. Yeah, so or, or there or thereabouts. Anyway, there's there's a yeah. difference between Monaco and every other circuit. Yeah, so sure. why not add a little bit to that? Since Monaco is already an exception anyway, why not add? You know, an extra rule that just defines Monaco as a special case that needs special yeah. treatment in order to make it interesting. Well, like what I mean. It, like it, I, no, I was just gonna say it's. There's another race that happens this weekend, the the same mm. weekend, and that's the Indy 500. And the Indy 500 has exceptions and differences and rule in its rules to the rest of the Week season. Week qualifying, <laughs> uh, like where it it still fits into the IndyCar season, but yeah. it's a different spectacle. And I wouldn't necessarily object to having a. Sl- I mean, there's so many things that are like weird, quirky exceptions with monaco anyway in the first place like Mm. it used to be somewhere where we couldn't run on a friday for example once upon a time i mean that's changed now but like only recently though yeah Yeah. only only in recent years um they used to do their own tv direction again i think that's now finally changed but even even still um the podium they do the trophy presentations before the anthems and like just like all these weird little yeah just bits and pieces that are just like nope this is monaco so we're going to do it differently like why not just have a slightly different tire rule then that i mean make it so that during the race it is literally nothing but soft and give them a slightly different allocation of tires for to accommodate for that and you can basically say the the forced change of compound is out the window but you're only running because you're only running softs but you can then stop as few or as many times as you can make those softs work. So if someone yeah. somehow managed to do 74 laps or whatever it is, 78 laps that were on these days and managed to make a set of softs last that, then fair play to them. But if yeah. they want to push and do two or three stops, then let them. Like... And the thing is, like th- that tie would degrade so quickly that the differential in performance between a fresh soft and a gone soft is, yeah. is going to mean you, you are going to get overtaking. Another another thing they can do is change the track. Like you know, times well, change. The cars have changed so many mm-hmm. times over the years. Yeah. Why are we so you know Silverstone's changed? That's the first circuit that ran a Formula One race, isn't it? So yeah. Yeah. why why can't, why does Monaco have to stay the same? Why not adapt it slightly to give us a longer straight or some you know create an overtaking overtaking opportunity I on think, the track? I think you. You're literally just limited by the streets at that point, though, as to where there is a way. There is the, 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 there's mm. a particular part where they could they could extend the uh, like a particular part of one of the straights. They could it is possible to to make it longer. I think it's the bit before um, might be the bit before the tunnel. I want to say mm. like the run down to the new Val chicane. They're doing a lot of land reclamation there as well. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, could be an opportunity. Like I I will say, particularly now on a 24 race calendar there's space on the calendar to have a race where qualifying is almost the main event and the Grand Prix is a bit processional. Like there is space in 24 races to have something that maybe isn't, you know, works a bit different. It's not quite the same spectacle. Mm. But that being said, like this weekend did feel like a perfect storm of the way the race played out, destroyed all the strategy. There was like 
less overtaken than we've had in a very long time because the cars don't suit it. Like there was no weather to mix things up. Like yeah. it did feel about as bad as it got this weekend. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it was absolutely worst case scenario I think for this yeah. race. But you know, it would be it would be knee jerk to mandate change based on one race because we have re- in recent times had decent races there. But yeah. They usually have come as a result of some crazy external factor. Usually, yeah, the weather. it's usually yeah. weather, if anything, isn't it? Yeah, and um, you just can't rely on that for, for your Formula no. One. You know, you can't rely on like the weather. What sport in the world relies on the weather in order to make that sport interesting? Yeah, you know, yeah. like it's just it doesn't it doesn't add up, does it? It's not. No. There are things that they can control that they they should change in order to make the Monaco Grand Prix the best Monaco Grand Prix it can be and I have, I would have no objection to that yeah all that said <laughs> um, as a kind of headline at the top Leclerc winning his home race was pretty great to see oh, yeah. like yeah, everything definitely. from the last lap onwards was, was great like just so nice to see and the emotion of it all and i love that um the prince of monaco who normally runs away before the champagne comes out was there with his own bottle of champagne getting yeah. involved yeah like, yeah going for it yeah um really good to see like he i mean he aced it on the saturday ultimately like that's that's what really mattered um although to be fair he did have to manage two race starts and like you yeah. know nail it off the line like that's the most dangerous being monaco and he nailed it both times yeah um, he had to work for it yeah, well earned, really well managed. Um, it breaks a 39 race streak since he last won, and it's uh, 12 pole positions that he's not converted into wins until now. So, um, yeah, good turn of fortune for Broken him. his duck um, a little bit, hasn't he, there? Yeah, It was definitely. nice to see as well, like, both Leclerc and Vesa and then someone else as well just jump in the harbour at the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ticking all the boxes. Yeah. Um... Obviously, aided by the fact that Red Bull, again, just didn't look happy all weekend. Um, much the same as Imola, that car just doesn't like bumps and curbs and stuff. Um, and I, th- I don't think it's necessarily that this car is like worse at that. I think it's more that last year or two, it probably had the same weakness, but it just meant that instead of winning a race by 25 seconds, they'd only win it by... 18 seconds whereas yeah. now everybody else has closed that gap yeah this weakness is losing them races yeah um, exactly i mean we saw it in singapore last year they lost they did lose a race you know towards the end of last year when ferrari looked like mm. they'd more or less just about caught up that, that that's when you can trace this back to then you can trace this and vegas as well vegas you know um Ferrari looked really, really there or thereabouts in Vegas. Another street circuit, another bumpy situation. Um, so yeah, there's definitely. I think that development deficit closing up as much as it has has definitely exasperated this weakness for them much more than it has been in previous previous seasons. Um, we're actually a third of the way into the season now. Um, mm. Verstappen's got five wins of the eight races we've had. Um, 31 points is the gap now between Verstappen and uh, Leclerc mm-hmm. and it's 24 points between Ferrari and Red Bull that's um, with a retirement as well with yeah, yeah that's retirement. yeah which is a big part of that gap I think um, but even so um, I'll dip into the inbox to ask the question which I feel like with this, I feel like we're going to be revisiting this question most weeks but Benson asks with three different winners in the last three races, have we got a title fight in our hands or will it be business as usual with Max domination by the time we get to Montreal? I don't think he'll dominate Montreal. I think there's I a, a lot of that circuit yeah. is about riding the curbs and you know it is effectively, it is a, a partial street circuit. Yeah, it's a, it's a pu- not, public it's road. It's not a dedicated race track, is it? Yeah. So um, there's definitely going to be aspects of that circuit that don't suit the Red Bull. Um, but to answer the question will Verstappen I guess you know the, the subtext here is will Verstappen still win the championship and I think I think he will I, well I said I said a couple uh, last week <laughs> he'd won the he won at Imola so he's gonna win yeah the, you, you already called it he's gonna win the season I called it in the Imola preview yeah he's still definitely the favourite but it's he's not gonna have it all his way um, I think the constructors he's looking more and more open especially oh yeah if we wanna move on to Perez like well, I mean, 
just just didn't do the job in qualifying, which is the bit that matters this weekend. Um, I mean, you just you just can't be dropping out in Q1 in a Not in that car. car that's in a championship fight. It's it's yeah. a in simple the fastest as that. car. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. It, look. Even even if you would say like I, you would say this weekend, it wasn't even it wasn't the fastest car. Fair no, enough. I agree. But it wasn't it wasn't a Q one exit car. Let's put it that way. Um, we have the stats proof that wasn't it. It, it, it should have easily should've... been in Q three. Yeah, like you only have to look at um, the kind of people that did get to Q three in Perez's absence to show that he should have been in Q three. Realistic. Yeah, you're, you're um, talking about your albums, your yeah, Albon, Gasly, Sonoda, Gasly's... like none of those cars should be beating a Red Bull. No, yeah, Mercedes. not a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we had the lap one crash, um, which caused a red flag. Um, I mean, a big old impact for Perez. That car was very second hand by the end of that. I think. Um, I think he's quite lucky that he went into the barrier like he went like along the barrier as so like when you first saw the damage to the car when they were up on the bend going into casino square like it fortunately looked a lot worse there than it did during like it was still a, a hefty shunt but i think he's very lucky that he ended up like going along the barriers with both sides of the car rather than going into the barriers like yeah. he potentially could have um mm. cuz it would have been a lot I think it would have been a lot worse yeah. if, if right. it had gone like into them. Magnussen has taken a lot of crap for this, K Mag has. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put my neck right on the line here and say this is at best at, at worst this is fifty fifty. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd it agree. went down as a racing incident. It went I think, I that's, think that I think is that's the right fair. decision. But I think yeah. Perez is he knows exactly where he is. He's looking yeah. in his mirror. Yeah. He knows that gap's closing. Why not leave space? Why end your race like that? On, on honestly, I I'm gonna say that he's too busy looking in his mirror to realise how far up that hill he is and realise how close he is to the, the kink that is what's so it's caused driver the error, you think? Yeah. I I think he is. The fact that he's looking so hard in his right hand mirror trying to make sure he squeezes Magnuson to the point where Magnuson has to give up. He's then probably come away from looking at that to realise how close he actually is to that kink, at which point Magnuson... I mean, admittedly, Magnuson hit the wall before he hit Perez, but there's there's two sides to it. This is why I think it's 50-50. Perez has the right to defend his position, but he doesn't have the right to completely shut the door to against that barrier mm-hmm. when yeah. Magnuson's getting as close to him as he is. So that's that's where Perez is at fault. Where Magnussen, I think, is at fault is he has a right to attack him going up the hill because yeah. there is room for two cars to go side by side up Absolutely. there. But at the point that he sees Perez coming across as far as he is, he has to play the smart game and he has to lift out of that. And I'm not saying that avoids the incident completely, but he basically just doesn't lift and he just keeps going in into yeah. the incident. So I think there's blame to be apportioned at both sides. But yeah. Perez has to leave him more room than what he did. He has to. Yeah. He he had he you know yeah you're right. Magnussen did have the option to to back out of the move, but why should he? He's trying to overtake him. Mm. You know, like he should be given the fair room. His... I, I think that's the story of a lot of the instance Magnussen's been in this season, though. He's sticking his nose somewhere and just keeping his foot in, come what may. Like, mm. but both both drivers there had an opportunity to make that incident not happen yeah. and carry on and do the race. Yeah. And yeah. both of them just... Did it anyway. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. went ahead and did it anyway. You know what? Yeah. And both of them have got previous in this exact yeah. situation yeah, as completely. well. completely. Both of them are... This, the problem is they're the <laughs> same. They're, they're both... This, it's, it's, it's an unstoppable object. Me, unstoppable <laughs> yeah, it really is. An immovable object. <laughs> they both are just unwilling to yield. And that's, uh, what, and that's why it's a 50-50 racing incident. For yeah. Me. I don't, but I don't think it's fair. The amount of... All the hate in all the comment sections in all the articles is directed at at Magnussen, and I just the don't thing, think it's it's right. The I thing think... is, everyone was watching this race like, oh, what's Magnussen going to do to get yeah, his race yeah. banned? So everyone was primed for Jumped something to it. happen. So the moment he was in a crash and he didn't get a penalty for yeah, it, yeah. 
everyone lost and their minds. All the people making these comments are Muppets who've never even sat in a go kart as well. Can I just point out that that I know it wasn't turn one, but that unfolded almost identically to what I said was going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually, Perez doesn't qualify. Feels ridiculous pressure from being around people he feels they shouldn't be around, and does something stupid trying to defend yeah. against one of those people, and that is pretty much what yeah. happened. I mean, yeah, fair enough, it happened going up the hill and not into Saint Devot, but Still. regardless, it's just, it's it is the outcome, and so I, I think could, I could just see it yeah. happening well in advance before we'd even got to the circuit. You could just tell Perez was in that zone because of what has been going on in like last race before and so on. We've seen it the last two seasons. It's the same thing repeating itself. It's Perez mm. starts the season fairly well, has a dip in form, overcompensates and gets in stupid instance like this. Yeah. Like he'd already, I think, lost a place to Bottas in turn one. And I think he was just like, Well, I've lost one place, there's no way I'm losing the second one. Yeah. I'm just gonna shut the door mm. on him. Guys, to be fair to Magnuson, Magnuson it. actually had a pretty good start <laughs> because Magnuson did I think Joe and his teammate Hulkenberg into turn one. And then that's what put him alongside, or well, attempting to get alongside Perez. Um, so Magnussen did actually have a fairly decent start up to that point, to be fair to him. But uh, again, in the interest of balance, Magnussen, it's lap one in Monaco. You're going up the hill. It's barely wide enough for two cars. You're yeah. leaving your nose like not even a third of the way alongside another car maybe lift and live to fight another day like magnuson keeps doing this maybe um, but knowing that it's going to be virtually impossible to overtake you're going to take whatever opportunity you can to overtake you right? are surely but still i don't know that's my counter to that that would be my one counter to it i think yeah. you overall i think you are right i think you know surviving it's, it, racing the start, instant is the right choice yeah surviving the start probably should be the priority but i think yeah i think he had it i think he was far enough alongside and i think the fact that perez is looking in his mirrors the whole time during this in, this incident yeah totally absolves yeah. yeah he knew exactly what he was doing he knew what was happening it's not like he's forgotten the route of the circuit suddenly just because it's the start <laughs> of the race he knew what was going to happen and he let it happen so yeah, equally um, 50 50 split. I think for me. The, the biggest, like, sort of shame out of all that, to be honest, is Hulkenberg. Because Hul oh, Hulkenberg yeah. sort of saw it happening. And there's, there's literally a moment of Hulkenberg's on board where you can see he's sort of thinking, do I back out to avoid this or do I gun it to avoid this? And he, like, goes, I'm going to gun it. And he's like, I'm probably like <laughs> yeah. a split second too that, late. If he'd that gone, slight that, hesitation. Yeah, yeah. That hesitation of, him. do I go or do I hold back? If he'd have just gone, he'd have probably just about got away from it. Yeah, and but, his radio said it all. He was just yeah. like, that's so unnecessary, yeah. which is completely true. <laughs> yeah, um, He's not wrong. I'd like to suggest a tweak to Formula One rules off the back of this incident. Oh? Because at the moment, it's um, there's an incident. It's either racing incident or you apportion blame and give that driver a penalty okay i would like there to be a third option which is you've both done something stupid we're gonna give yeah. you both some penalty points yeah, yeah why not it seems weird when it's like racing incident even though they both did something stupid they both kind of get a let off because they were equally stupid like, but i would argue, throw the book at both of them i would argue in this in this case if you were going to give i would go as far to say if you were going to give penalty points to anyone it would be to be to pair i would say you could argue that Perez is the slightly more the person who's in control of whether or not this collision happens because he's the, the, there's nowhere for Magnussen to go. He's up, he's up yeah. alongside. There's nowhere else for him to go. Perez has the option of leaving space and doesn't take it, and therefore has caused the incident. It was actually exactly the same as the Magnussen and Sergeant crash in Miami. It's identical. Magnussen mm. put his nose up the inside sort of left it there sergeant turned in as if he wasn't there it's exactly yeah. the same incident um mm, and i think that similar. one went down in fact no i think in that on that occasion i think magnuson was given the blame for it but yeah yeah just not a good all round. no yeah we can move i think i've said my piece have you guys <laughs> said your piece on this yes yeah um meanwhile on lap one uh ocon decided to uh also take a lap one put it all on the line lunge uh, on his teammate mm. and nearly managed to take them both out um, into Portier before the tunnel uh, as it was he only took himself out of the race Gasly managed to stay in and 
actually picked up a point, which was pretty decent for Gasly. Um, and that was the second time they'd made contact as well. <laughs> Ocon had a go at the top of the hill yeah. and very nearly had a similar accident to the one Perez and Magnussen had. But he was left space and didn't obviously and the the accident didn't happen. I think I think Ocon sort of saw it coming and yeah, left some space so did, it didn't. Did what hit Perez him. should have done. <laughs> yeah. Um but like what was Ocon doing? He just seemed to lose his head and just like Well, it's that again, it's that sort of it's that just it's just that first lap like madness, isn't it? It's that it's that first when when you're on the first lap of a mm-hmm. race it, it is like it's it's a real hustle, you know, especially around a circuit like this where you know these where you know you're not going to get another chance to overtake. So you just some drivers just send it all into that first lap while they've got the opportunity, thinking that it's not going to come around again. Now, I don't I'm I'm amazed that this warranted a penalty, but the previous incident didn't. The Perez and Magnussen incident Oh, I think this was what didn't constitute penalty. Mm. Do you? I don't think I, I mean do think it didn't leave him worse. space on the exit, admittedly, but I think that's that's kind of driver and that is driver error. But that to me felt like a, you know he was down the inside he was there he was visible you could see him he, he he got the apex and it was only the exit of the corner what that that was that he didn't leave space and he you know climbed up his his front wheel I think I think, I think other than that other than that last final bit of not leaving space on the exit I think that's a legit move it was I think with the Perez and Magnuson one you can make the argument like it's the start of the race there's a lot going on you know. It's, it's a very tight bit of track what Ocon did was very much a calculated I am going to throw it to the inside here and he's going to have to get out of my way and Gasly just didn't have anywhere to go like he, he no room he tried to overtake and just it. drove into him like yeah but he didn't he didn't make contact until he was more or less by because his rear wheel went up I thought it was a double uh, contact they made was, there a, was it, it a double it, contact it, his, rear, his rear wheel hit the side pod and then he continued forward, which then oh. caused him to go wheel to wheel, which is what then launched the car. Yeah, I mean, he's he's taken blame for it. I'm pretty sure he was told to because um, Bruno Famine, the team principal, was livid. Um, it, it was all to French media, so I, I only saw like the translations, but he was absolutely yeah. livid. Um, even saying without saying the exact words suggesting that they he's considering benching Ocon for the next race as a punishment for this like mm. I think it's a bit of, it's a whole bit of it's just racing isn't it though like it is but racing. I think like, I think the difference is, the, is when it's your teammate like mm. you, you you're in a position there where you can potentially looking at the way this race pans out you can finish 9th and 10th and score a couple of decent sets of points for a team that was struggling at the beginning of their season and just needs to claw back any point that they can. If they can manage to finish 9th and 10th and mm-hmm. score the three points that that brings them compared to the only one that they ended up with, which could have been more if it wasn't for this incident, that's where the that's where it's going from. Like, yeah, clatter into one of your rivals and do that. Yeah, it's stupid. You've cost yourself a, you know, a chance at points, but it's like, it's not almost taken out the team's only opportunity at points. Like, yeah, yeah. And I agree. <clears throat> From the team's perspective, I absolutely agree there. You don't want to see your two drivers colliding and taking each other or risk taking each other out of the race or even one of them out of the race. But that's a matter for the team. That's not a matter for the stewards. And I think if... if I still think if the perez Magnussen incident didn't warrant a penalty, then I don't see how this warrants a penalty. Because it's still lap one. You know, usually they give a bit of a carte blanche on that. On that, I mean, one. For, is, for, is it for like me, halfway lap one that 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 no longer applies. Like for for me, there's a probably a little bit of a difference where in the Magnussen Perez one, like what we've talked about before, there's there's a there's a plausibility that either one of them could have potentially avoided the incident. Whether whether it's on Magnussen, whether Magnussen should have to or not is another matter, but he could have kind of lifted out of that and potentially avoided it. So there's potential that both drivers could avoid it, which is, I guess, where Chris's kind of point is. We need to start thinking about, could you have 
racing incident, but you both still get a penalty anyway, <laughs> for example. Yeah. Um, but, okay, I, need to, um, I think I need but to I watch think this again. When, when I think when when you when you like yeah, when you look at the Gaslan o- Gasly Ocon one, it's essentially a dive bomb and Gasly does not have any time to get out of the way or react. Like it, the move comes earlier. Gasly can back out of the corner, but Gasly's already turning into the corner at the time that Ocon is dive bombing, dive bombing down his inside. If he makes the move before the apex and puts himself legitimately alongside him, then yeah, fair enough. More racing incident. It's unfortunate that it's two teammates, but if anything, you'd say Gasly shouldn't be turning in. But Gasly, I mean, I'm not looking at it, so you can, if you're looking at it, you can correct me, but I'm pretty confident in saying Gasly is like, halfway to the apex as Ocon then dives down the inside nah, very he, late. The, it's before the apex. He, he's there. Let me just go back to the start of this. If yeah, you, I mean, there's that the, the, Gasly's ahead at the apex. Gasly's front yeah. wheels are ahead of Ocon's front wing at, at the apex. The problem is he's lost control. I think the issue that... Wait, which which, which, which here, way are you saying that the right way around? So Ocon's ahead of Gasly. Right. Ocon's but, on the inside, ahead of Gasly. He, Ocon's the the rear of Ocon's front left is ahead of Gasly's front wing. The issue I think the stewards have taken here is that on the exit, Ocon is not in control of his car. His wheel is is kind of fishtailing. His wheels, his rear yeah, wheels are spinning, definitely up, not. and that's what's sort of sent him out of control into the side of of Gasly on on his outside on to his left. And then he's obviously climbed over, and it's a very spectacular jump in the air from a Formula One car, yeah. which is obviously the. I mean, likes to see p- stuff potentially like that. the move the move starts a bit further back than I I'm remembering it to be then, but I think I think in the grand scheme of things, essentially, Gasly does enough to stay as far on that outside as he can. There's nowhere else he yeah, can he go. Yeah, does. There's nowhere else. There's a wall. I, but this is my point. Like up up until the point of contact, I think it's a legit move. It's only the fact that he's lost control of the vehicle and gone into him mm. that. It's it, it, it illegitimizes the move. I think you're absolutely within your rights to dive bomb down the inside of another car as long as you don't make contact. <sighs> I'm not sure I agree on that. Like, if you watch Gasly's on board, he's got a Williams and a Sauber in front of him. Both of them take the normal racing line all the way to the left and sweep across. Gasly actually stays in the middle of the track and turns in really early for that corner. And mm. then Ocon still yeah. just comes into a gap well, like the thing is like that's racing right people people yeah you you can try to defend but if so if you don't if you don't defend hard enough and someone comes down your inside then they've come down your inside and they've got the corner regardless I mean, I'm... though of whether the stewards need to get involved with that or not you don't do that to your teammate on lap one of the race especially when Probably you've already not. made contact with them once more earlier in the lap mm. like there is something about Ocon that when he sees a car with the same livery as his, he seems to lose his head a little yeah, bit. Yeah, like he gravitates the towards them. The amount of times he had, he's had contact with his teammate. Mm. Um, in fact, I saw someone um, online earlier today talking about this. And there's a few interviews you can see with Ocon about like his history and how he, he grew up. And, you know, we all know like Ocon came from a very humble background and like his parents work crazy hard like not dissimilar to the way Lewis Hamilton sort of found his seat and Ocon has said that like the way he goes racing the aggressive moves he makes comes from a place of when he was a kid like he didn't even know if he would make the next race so he had to get the absolute maximum result every single race he was in which you know what great it worked for him he did that but it's kind of like he never lost that mentality. And it's like, you're a Formula One driver now. You've been doing it for years. You yeah. don't have to make every single do or die move and prove yourself every single weekend. And it kind of feels like that's what he's always yeah, doing, the, the guy's, particularly with his teammates. The guy's been in the sport for, what, seven, seven years now? Yeah. Six, Must maybe be. seven years? Or, well... Seven years, maybe six seasons, because he had that one season sat on the sidelines, I think, didn't he? Or was it two seasons sat on the sidelines where he was out of his seat for a little while? But regardless, like, he's been around long enough. He's got well over 100 race starts in him. And if he still feels that he's got to be that desperate to prove a point against his teammate, then he's probably got the wrong mentality. And, and that is probably 
what is going to essentially annoy the Alpine leadership mm. and like they've they've been very um open about the fact of well no one's got a contract next year so let's just see what incidents like this yeah, yeah. you okay. know do with for this, a decision making process uh, so. you're halfway you, you, you you've gone a good percentage to convince me but here, here's here's where i stand on it and here's how I, I, we might have to agree to disagree but I will admit it's an elbows out room, an elbows out move, especially against your teammate. But mm. I think if that move comes off and there's no contact, then everyone's yeah. going, "Wow, that was a mega move," especially on your teammate. But I think I think here's the difference: is there's five or six drivers higher up that grid that I'd have put money on making that work without making contact with the other car, and Ocon is not mm. one of them. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. Ocon, Ocon, and I guess Ocon, the, the, fact Ocon, is... the likes of Ocon, Magnus and Stroll, whoever, they're the kind of people that would probably put their car where Ocon put his car and the same catastrophic, catastrophic event would happen. Mm. Whereas you put your Hamiltons, your Sciences, um, Verstappen, Leclerc, like them, they're going to pull that off if they get given that opportunity. Mm. Like that's the difference for me is that... Okay. You've convinced me. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think the probably, move I think, I think the move is wrong, doable. I think I, this is the I, problem I that you that, that you've got there, Stu. Is the reason I think it comes down to being a penalty is you're right in the sense that the move is a doable move. It's a legit you, move in that. Course. It is a legit There's move. With it if, and as the long as you make fact, it, the fact that contact. he cocked it up is why he's got a penalty because yeah. he could have actually made the move, and okay. other drivers on that grid probably would have made the move. So back to my original point, though, like by the letter <laughs> of the law. Ocon did cause a collision because he lost yeah. control of his vehicle. And I have yeah. no objection yeah. probably to, to, you know, he did cause a collision. I've, I said from the start, I've said that. Yeah. The issue yeah. I have is why is that a penalty? But Perez and Magnuson having a collision together, neither of them back, a penalty. Well, you're back asking for consistency now, Stu. That's oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, that, that I, I won't muddy the yeah. waters any further. I mean... I'll just point out, at least I was right when I said we'd spend 25 minutes talking about lap yeah, one. Yeah, you were right. How far in are you? <laughs> yeah, actually. Haven't we finished yet? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think the bigger issue for him is, I, I, I'd say there's very little chance they're going to keep the same driver lineup next year. Yeah. And things like that are only going to swing it one way. I mean, yeah, I mean then if, again, it might not if, be either of them. <laughs> if we keep getting moves like this by one, I mean, that's not going to do anything to improve their relationship that move is it so no, if we no. keep getting stuff like this happen then something will have to give we might even end up with a you know a, a new driver for the second half of the season if this stuff keeps happening. quite possibly because Jack, they just can't afford to in the wings. Doing. no not at all um we're out a few few other things um we should mention carlos Sainz came third despite <laughs> having that contact with piastri at the first start getting a puncture that dropped him to the back but was then given third place back on the restart um did you see the reasoning for why he got his third place back? Oh, it's to do with yes, the point so that all cars passed the timing barrier. and so, Yeah, basically yeah, because... Joe, Joe hadn't. Yeah, because yeah. Joe got caught up behind the crash going up the hill, not every car had crossed the line at the end of Sector 1. So the next line back that they use is the safety car line, which is pit lane exit. So that's where they yeah. took it from. So even though Signs was at the side Dead of the track the behind... Yeah. He got it yeah, back. I think that very, very lucky boy. It's the it's the same issue that I have as the and they've changed this rule since. But can you remember the jump start where I think it was Norris in maybe Saudi last year, or was it a someone jumped did a did a ever so slight jump start, stopped and then then the lights went yeah. green and the well, lights went out. Sorry, and then they mm -hmm. they went and it was a very clear jump start. But because the everyone saw it on camera everyone yeah. knew that it happened but because the sensor didn't pick it up they couldn't apply the rule to enforce punishment on the driver who'd very clearly done a jump start yeah this to me is is a very similar thing we can see everyone can see on camera that that car was pretty much out of the race and everyone was going to go by him before he could get around mm -hmm. to 
do a pit stop or whatever. <clears throat> I don't know quite what happened because because I only watched the thirty minute highlights because I'd heard what a dull race this was. <laughs> I didn't see, and maybe I should watch the whole thing. And you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing a podcast. <laughs> there if is I'm it, not gonna watch there the isn't anything to watch. He eats anything. anything. He got a puncture, sensibly pulled it over there because Did it was a central go, place go for him by? to stop. Everyone except Joe went by him. Maybe even Joe did eventually. And, yeah. um, I mean, he was bringing it back round with the guise of, well, at least I can put, you know, uh, a, a new set of tyres on First and start from back, try, yeah. try and start from the back. Yeah. Like, th- that, w- that was the original plan. Like, it's, from what I can tell, for, you know, it was the FIA who went to Ferrari in this scenario, not Ferrari, like, appealing. Because yeah. it looked like... Because like they, they, they almost they almost looked as surprised as everyone else when they were told to wheel the car up to the front of the, of the line. Yeah, to be brutally yeah, honest with kind you, kind of kind of dumb, isn't it? Bit weird. Yeah. Because because for all intents and purposes, like they've seen the same thing as everyone else, which is, well, we've entered the next sector and we were at the back. Like, so that you know they they've applied the same logic as literally everybody else watching. Um, yeah, and obviously if you're a you know, silly if you're quirk in the rules. And you've gained a place, and you're looking to sort of be the main rival to Red Bull this season, mm. and your sort of additional rival Ferrari have suddenly got an all extra yeah. place on you. Then that's that's a problem, isn't Mc- it? McLaren weren't yeah. best pleased. No, um, understandably. Speaking of, um, still second and fourth, good result for them. Uh, I mean, Piastri was fantastic. Like, yeah, his qualifying lap was exceptionally good. Um, and then, yeah, even though he lost a bit of uh, downforce um, with that bit of damage from signs, he still was, again, hard to really judge because they were all driving so slowly. Yeah. But even well, so, yeah. like... He, he said he'd lost like half a second a lap and it's like, yeah, yeah like, I, everyone's driving 10 seconds <laughs> slower than they're capable yeah. of. What's this, a drop yeah, in the ocean? Oh, wow. <laughs> there was, what was it? There was a differential that got mentioned on F1 TV. It was like... In order to be able to make an, a, a, an overtake work here, you have to be four seconds a lap faster than the person in front of you. The the lap itself is only seventy four seconds. Like, it, yeah, that, it's, it's such a. But even so, like that's that's a that's a, such a ridiculous stat because yeah, all every every car if they're lapping ten seconds slower, then every single car on that grid was in theory on that basis would be able to overtake the car yeah, overtake yeah, exactly. yeah. they just couldn't what they did the problem weird... isn't that they were unable to overtake the problem is they were unwilling to overtake because they didn't want yeah. to kill their tyres they wanted to get to yeah. the end they were too scared to to waste the tyre life because it was going to put them under threat and make them have to make a pit stop when no one else was yeah. going to do a pit stop it's got nothing to do the, the issues that were faced at Monaco in this in this very specific situation this weekend but nothing to do with the size of the car nothing to do with the the weight of the car nothing to do well something to do with the weight of the car because that <laughs> increases tyre wear but it wasn't the car's fault per se it wasn't the dimensions of the car's fault it wasn't and the size of the road and any of that stuff it was the fact that the the peak strategy was to not do a pit stop so yeah. they weren't willing to use the tyres yeah, yeah. I mean, you 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 saw exactly how that was the fact as well because you got the people that managed to eke out the gaps. So you got like your got like your front runners that managed to eke out the gap to the midfield, and then there was like a portion of the midfield which then Alonso essentially buffed everyone behind that back to give Stroll the gap. Yeah. Uh, so you'd got these like two sets of things where the the tail car in each of those sets could essentially pit for free without being caught by the car behind them have completely fresh tyres, fully attack to get back up behind the car ahead of them and then be able to do absolutely grand sum of nothing. Despite, yeah. Well, I mean, the Ham- Hamilton and Verstappen were the main two that had the opportunity. Stroll had an opportunity until he decided to put it in the side of a wall like he always does. Um, but, like, I mean, in theory, Stroll should have had that opportunity. He just ruined it for himself before he got that far. Yeah, yeah. But if you look, you just have to look at Hamilton and Verstappen as to why... Even that didn't work. So, and that's because the grip differential just wasn't there. You know, yeah, we, we we saw cars go side by side in areas of this circuit. There just there wasn't enough of a differential. It's too, in grip too slow speed. Cars. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, a couple of other bits to uh, wrap up. I've got to mention Aston Martin, who again qualified terribly. <laughs> mm. Alonso mm. spent all that time backing the pack up to give Stroll a free pit stop ahead of him, um, which he Doing did. What he does best. 
And then Stroll uh, repaid Alonso by immediately uh, clipping his new tire on the wall and giving himself a puncture and making it all for nothing, which was yep. um, a peak Stroll moment. <laughs> um, yeah, another add it, add it to the real. Them. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, Snowder in the points again. Uh, he's scored in five of the eight races. He's already surpassed his points total from last season. Um, <laughs> not bad for a team that weren't expecting to get any points because only the top five teams score points yeah that 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 whole thing has uh, very quickly gone away hasn't it that whole narrative mm. um, Ricardo, meanwhile he had another bit of, of a stinker really um, he's actually only finishing the points once since he made his comeback when Sonoda's just racking them up which is not a good look um, and finally Williams got their points first points of the season um, really good qualifying session for Albon um, lifts them off the bottom up into eighth place, which yeah. is so, which so is only, nice to see. Only Sauber now waiting to score points. Is that yes, right? that is right. Yeah. Williams wow. and our Alpine are both on two points. Williams are ahead on um, position finished. So and, uh, all so just about all the teams have scored points now, and we're, and we're not even halfway through the season. Yet. Yeah, mm. and, well, and so much for half and half. The dynamic of that whole Ocon thing fits into the narrative perfectly there because well, the exactly, reason Williams yeah. are jumping above Alpine is because the Williams is a ninth and the Alpines is two tenths. So it just both. shows how important it could have been for them both to be in that race and pushing yeah. the Williams for nine flight. Like, Absolutely. And yeah, I know we're talking about a race where there was like five overtakes and half of them were team orders and just givens, but like if you're not there to do it like it's not going to be happen, is it, it? Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Should we move on to a driver of the day then after all that summising? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard not to give it to Leclerc just because he won the race and there wasn't really much of no else amazing... That I didn't yeah, really he, see he, any amazing he driving. Just, he just managed it. Everyone else was doing the same thing like, you could give yeah. it to Perez for giving us the only bit of reasonable action <laughs> throughout the entire but then that race. also ruined the rest of the race so that it's like true. yeah <laughs> yeah. Perez um, giveth Perez taketh away Piastri for keeping Leclerc honest for the entire race but again it wasn't yeah. that much of a challenge for him yeah. Leclerc um, was just managing it wasn't he I think it just on, I think you know what I think it has to go to the person who got pole the day before because yeah. that is real driver of the day material. And yeah. the, the real day is here, isn't of this it? race is qualifying. It's not yeah. the race itself. So I think it, we have to give it to Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Chuck it is. Chuck McCluck. There we go. Um, okay, in terms of move of the day, I've already said it once. There were five. So I'm just going to list all five, and you can pick whichever one you think is a good one. <laughs> so go. you've got Bottas overtaking Joe, which is not going to happen because it was basically a team order. You've got Bottas and Sargent, which was hilarious because when it happened, Alex Jakes and Julian Palmer on commentary were the most ecstatic I've ever seen <laughs> yeah, anyone. To, it was like, oh my God, it's finally happened. Yeah, it was like they're being <laughs> ironic, but like yeah. kind of not as well, like halfway to being ironic, I mean, but actually yeah. like realizing that they've got a job to do and got to pretend to be enthusiastic yeah. at least about it. So, I think that's yeah, kind I, of what it was. It didn't sit well with me very um, well. Like. It, was, it was an all right overtake though, to be fair. It, it was a decent one. one. Yeah. Um, there was Stroll overtake Zhu. Sorry, Stroll overtook Joe and he overtook Sargent once he did have those new tyres, if I remember rightly. Is that? Yeah. That was. It was, and, yeah. And then binned it into the wall. Um, <laughs> and then Sargent also had an overtake on Guan Yu Zhou, um, which was um, the battle over the last place. I mean, none of them are good. Um, I'm going to suggest Sargent because it was really opportunistic. So when Stroll came yeah. back through on soft tyres, he got past um, Joe, um, sort of as they're coming down the hill, uh, the corner before the hairpin. And Sergeant was just like, oh, don't mind if I do. And just kind yeah. of nipped through and what? very opportunistically slipped through. It was actually a well. legit, it was actually the only legit move. Was it, yeah, I quite um, liked that. Was it somebody lapping that he took advantage of? Was that no, it was, what it, it was? No, it was Stroll coming through on his new tyres after okay. he cocked up and had to make an extra pit stop. Right, I couldn't remember yeah. if it was somebody uh, somebody lapping that Joe had to get out of the way of, and Sergeant was taking advantage. But yeah, I mean that one was decent. The one on Bottas on Sergeant was like a fairly legit one as well. Plus, it was the first proper one of the race, so it kind yeah. of 
he stuck with me for that reason, but he's pff, it's difficult. I isn't mean, it, we, this we, it's much of a muchness, isn't it? I'm going to say Sergeant just because we never give him anything. Yeah. Why? All right. Why not? You can have this one, Logan. <laughs> okay, and then the last award. Honestly, what the f- are we doing here? Okay, do you want to do your secret one first? Tom, I mean, or? it's not a secret one. It's just you didn't want me to tell me tell you. Yeah, well, I saw it live. to wait to hear it until now. <laughs> so, on at least two occasions, if not three, during that race, before the moment that Valtteri Bottas overtook Logan Sargent, in the bottom right-hand corner, it popped up saying, "Crypto overtake of the day vote." Yes. <laughs> then it flipped and went, "No overtakes, no vote," or something, something <laughs> stupid like that. Then went away. Oh, at show least, it. Oh, on at because least they've got to show two, the sponsor. Because they've got to show the sponsor. Yeah. But on at least two occasions, if not three, they showed it and went, no overtake, no vote, and then it went away again. And yeah, I was, was like, very funny. WTF. <laughs> I did I did try and take a screenshot of it, but I stupidly got the bit where it just it's doing the advertisement bit. I didn't get the bit when it flipped and <laughs> no, says no fine. overtake, you've, no award. You've painted a very, very vivid picture. But yeah, there, that that was that was mine. I was just like, what is this? What that is a good that, is, that is very good. <laughs> I do like that. Um, the amount of t- I've got a slightly more serious one. The amount of time it took from to show a red flag after the yeah. Perez incident. Why did that yeah. take so long to red flag? Given... Like, it's clear that the track was completely yeah. blocked. That should be yeah. red flags immediately. It looked like someone put a Formula One car like through a shredder and just sprinkled it across the yeah. track. Like yeah. it was the most obvious of red flags. Yeah, yeah. So they, were, they were all down me. through the tunnel, weren't they? At the time it got called. Yeah, it was because obviously. Gasly, uh, Gasly and Ocon was happening. That was before the red flag was thrown. I think yeah. the red flag got thrown like literally seconds after that, as yeah, they well, were going the, into the tunnel. The leaders were at the harbour because Piastri yeah. was right on the Clare's tail the first time they went uh, down to the chicane. Out of the yeah, tunnel. they were. So yeah, they would, did the Nouvelle chicane. They, I think. They, yes, they, they, they were two thirds. The, the leaders way the had. Line. Yeah, the leaders had done the Nouvelle chicane and were just just coming out of it and then starting to slow down. That's when you saw them all lift off because the red flag got called. Yeah, that was a weird. Yeah. One. Yeah. yeah, so I don't. I think it's a shame that that took as long as it did, and the fact that it took them that long, and then they still couldn't establish an order. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> that yeah. point, just like so crazy. Um, and then I think some of the penalty decisions as well are just it, as the incons- inconsistency from the stewards. Yeah. The, the old that, that old chestnut. That's just a given for the season, is it? <laughs> yeah, and, and I do it given for Formula One as a sport, isn't it? Yeah, I do like the. Overtake of the day award. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, I like that the most. <laughs> yeah. I think that I think we give Tom's secret. WTF That's the one. The, I, I, the, I thought you. Yeah. I'd, I'd change it from the list of Tom's secret WTF to what it actually was. Oh yeah, yeah. When, we'll do that. when Chris <laughs> when Chris looks back at this at the end of the season and tries to work out what all the interesting WTFs were, he's not going to remember what that was. Like Tom, I, quick, what was your secret in Monaco? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. Never ask that. Tommy's secrets. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, oh, secrets. I forgot to mention. Um, a slight tangent for move of the day if you didn't watch the formula two or formula three races watch those because ollie bearman had a bang of an overtake on uh kimmy antonelli um at the oh, very really? least go back and watch that yeah i haven't i wasn't able to i was at a wedding this weekend so i wasn't able to oh watch the, the feeder episode. series races were fantastic yeah they were good they're well worth going back to watch they were very good. anyway mm. uh right i'll quickly take us through predictions so um I actually had a decent week and I was really gutted that the Perez incident fell in the order that it did because if it had fallen my way, I would have genuinely had a five out of five. Yeah. But I only got a four. The double Leclerc, 16 finishes and Sonoda in eighth. Um, Chris Magnussen fell in your favour, so you got the first DNF. Um, the only person who also scored four other than me was Vinny Blanco, um, who had almost the same as me, but went with 19 finishes and Magnussen being the first DNF. So that's where the points differences but we still came out with four um in terms of the standings that means that we've now got a three-way tie uh for the lead we've got hollywood on 19 steen nielsen on 19 and then tom pennant also on 19 um if you want to know where you fall in all that and what points you got from this weekend head to back the and all the results and the standings are there uh, quick stop to the official F1 Fantasy League. Uh, Fast Track Racing won this week with 289 points, uh, but Chasey Motorsport still lead, leads the way there with 2018 total. And then over on Grid Rival, Fernando, I can't even say it, Fernando Albonzo, 
wherever <laughs> that name comes from, is um, on 1,022 for this week's win. But Mighty Hawk 44, again, still leads the way there with 7,742 points. Um, as mentioned, backthrough.com, you can find out more about the Predictions League and you can see the uh, Fantasy Leagues to chuck your team into the mix if you've already got one. And on that note, we'll do some inbox. Is <laughs> Keep it staying out. But stay, but stay out. Box, box, box. Hey, man. <laughs> okay, Tommy, you got the first one this week? Yeah. Uh, Kilowog says, uh, what's different at Ferrari in this Vasua era, and why do they suddenly feel the class of the field again? The difference is Vassar. <laughs> That's the <laughs> yeah, the, the difference is actual management. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like he's there to do a specific job and he's doing that specific job. It's not this kind of uh, someone at the top wearing many hats, which they mm. sort of did with Bonotto. And also I just think Vassar's got a lot of respect in the sport and he is able to like build a team around him. He's brought in some new people he's made some changes that it feels like previous team principals are almost afraid to make like i think a lot of people yeah. just get starstruck by the shiny red ferrariness whereas fred Vasseur just coming and been like it's just that needs changing get yeah. rid of him change yeah. that which yeah, is what they yeah. need i mean you only have Absolutely. to look at the the positive performance that has actually come out of leclerc's change in race engineer and that's a change that i wouldn't be surprised if it's come so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised that it's come from Freddie Vasseur, basically him saying, "This isn't working. This comms is not good enough. It's not supporting the driver. We're making a change. We're putting somebody else in there, and we will, you know, you are still part of this team. You will, you know, like what whatever that role ends up becoming, but that is not the right role and the right combination. And just being cutthroat about it. And sometimes you need that, especially in this sport where things like that have a huge impact." on results up and down a season um you only have to look at the the sort of meme highlight reel of all the silly radio messages and mistakes to to understand why freddie Vasua comes in this team and goes yep this is not good enough this is yeah you know it's all thing we're ferrari we're supposed to be the pinnacle of formula one like the the pinnacle team in the pinnacle motorsport <laughs> and we're making silly mistakes like that like it's got to be better, paid the so. most <laughs> yeah well it's, yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's not unlike in rush when um nicky lauda drives a ferrari <laughs> for the first time and expresses his opinion on it yeah. well i think i think this is the thing though these these are like i guess some pivotal moments in ferrari history when you think about it like that like Louder going there and not being afraid to say what he thinks of the car and why it needs to be improved. Even like when Ross Braun and Schumacher went there together, they were not afraid to, even if it was internally, and it wasn't necessarily an externally seen thing, but you know what both those two people are like within this sport and they will have been hypercritical and made sure that they got things changed and got things done. And I'm hoping... Freddie Vasseur is about to be starting a new era of that same kind of mentality. Feels like it. Like it. Hopefully. Yeah, that that would be great. I think if you can if you can take away some of that sensitivity they have around yeah. themselves being Ferrari yeah. and that yeah. sort high of on their own supply. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's such a good analogy. Um, <laughs> then, yeah, that that historically that is what it has taken to get Ferrari back into winning ways. Yeah. Um, We've seen it lots of times, so yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Um, next up, Mike P has a question for you, Stu. He says, "Yellow McLaren or blue Ferrari?" <laughs> uh, yellow McLaren, but the blue Ferrari didn't constitute a blue Ferrari for me. There's, there wasn't enough yeah. exactly. it to call it a blue Ferrari. Yeah. Um, We're still waiting I didn't, to see a blue Ferrari. I will, I will say, I didn't particularly like the blue on the Ferrari at the uh, thing. I think a Ferrari should be red with white or red with black or both. Mm-hmm which this one is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this, I mean, the, the McLaren with the center livery looked legit, didn't it? It looks yeah. so... I text both you guys when I saw it, it and all it, three of us were just like, whoa, this is it made me, it. it made me realize that we're missing like a proper yellow car on the grid. Mm. Yeah, I like yellow cars on an F1 grid. Yeah. It yeah. also made me wish... I think I've said this before, I'd love F1 to do what nascar do which is nominate one round and monaco would be the perfect place for it to be like throwback livery weekend and every yeah. team come and put like a special 
nostalgia livery on their cars. Like, I'd love to see something like that. Yeah. yeah. Although seeing Oscar Piastri in this McLaren, I just <laughs> felt to me like it was an Australia livery for him. He just looked yeah. like the same colours as it, Australian sports teams. It felt like we were watching the Olympics of motorsport. Yeah. And it was like, because it looked, especially the um, the race overalls, with like the yellow top and the green bottom, they just were really, really reminiscent of yeah. like Olympic uniforms that a lot of the athletes wear for Australia. Mm. Uh, next one is from Wesley and it says, Hey man, and when was the last time we had three different winners in three races? And we actually, someone stuck their neck out in this document and written the answer to that question. So I mean, that, um, that's wants to answer Chris it? and I'm pretty sure. The answer to that question checks. is, uh, it feels a long, feels longer ago, but it was actually 2022. It was Sainz won in uh, at Silverstone, Leclerc won Austria and then Verstappen won France. Which I believe oh, after, is that was the one where Leclerc just went into the wall. It was yes, yeah. which was also the beginning of like the period of Verstappen winning almost everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, there you go. Last yeah, one. Was. Last one. Uh, Jose says hello, friendio. Who? Uh, friendio. Oh, is that Jose? Yeah. No, As you, you said a different name to the name that's in the document, so you can oh, choose. Yeah, it's Jose. Oh, okay. I'll take you back. I apologize. <laughs> you, just went, you just went username. I went like legit <laughs> yeah. name. That's why. Um, so yeah, Jose says, as we saw this race was arguably about as entertaining as watching paint dry with the new 2026 regulations having slightly smaller cars. Do you think this will be enough to have cars be able to race here or will it not be enough and we are doomed to have a car parade in Monaco for the foreseeable future? There's an easy answer to this question, isn't there? Yeah, well, I think we've kind of covered it's it earlier. Going to take more yeah. than that, yeah. The um, the size difference is not going to be enough because it's going to put us back to what twenty twenty sizes or something. They're like not that, that much right? smaller. Yeah, no, they're not. They're not, they're not that much like different. Or so. it's, it's yeah, tiny. it's not. It's not enough. Let's put it that way. Mm. So, um, but I mean, it but, could I mean, be worse. So this this race was the lowest number of overtakes in a Grand Prix since twenty twenty one. And the Monaco race in 2021 had zero overtakes. Mm. Well, you can't get so, less than that, can you? No. <laughs> um, and the two races in between had, like, I think it was 13 and 22, but they also both had rain, which made a difference yeah. to that. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's it. the problem is relying on rain every time we come to Monaco. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just not sustainable. They need to do something special to make Monaco, to, to make the race around Monaco be the spectacle it deserves to be currently qualifying is the spectacle i can't spit the spectacle but currently <laughs> qualifying is the spectacle of of the monaco grand prix and the grand prix should be the spectacle of the monaco grand yeah. prix not qualifying as exciting as qualifying is as much as we all love it and as much as we love the peril of who's going to be on pole position it's the most important pole position of the year all that it'll still be the most important pole position of the year, but there has to be a way of making it so people can get by each other. Yeah. And I think I think even like in years gone by, even if there wasn't any overtakes, there was always... It felt like there used to be more of a, a peril of anyone could clip a wall at any moment. Mm. And even that doesn't seem to... Like, didn't we have every car finish at monaco a few last years year. back yeah last year yeah like I that is unheard of going years. back um uh, yeah again like i said earlier like in a 24 race calendar there's definitely room to have a weekend that plays out a bit differently and monaco qualifying is still one of the best days of the year for formula one season so yeah, yeah. i mean the, but the, I don't the think... thing is Go on, you never you, well i was just gonna say you're never gonna get people in barriers making mistakes when they're driving at 70 percent capacity yeah they're not they doing were, 10 temps. They, they weren't they weren't temps. yeah they yeah. weren't doing what they are capable of around that circuit no one was pushing it the only person that ever came close to pushing it at any point was probably Verstappen after he came out on the pits mm. um, with that sort of free stop because even ha even Hamilton came out the pits with fresh tyres and then I mean that should have been a WTF actually Hamilton turning around to his engineer and saying yes you, ne you never told me how important the uh, outlap was and how hard to push like you've been an F1 driver for what is it 15 years now more than 
Like, how have you not worked out that an outlap mm. is important? Like, come but on. But you man. are relying on getting that information from your race engineer, though. Like that. Oh, I don't know. Like that. That, that is, is common a, sense a, that's to a me. Team, that is a team um, thing because you don't know when he found out it was going to be pitting either. You don't know when. Like they might have told him halfway around the lap that it was going to be he was going to be pitting this lap, you know. And then he's not had the opportunity to push on the on the couple of in lap or the, or the in lap yeah. before. Yeah. I'm with Hamilton on this one. Like, if there's a chance for an undercut and the team tell you to do a normal outlap, not like you might overtake Verstappen, you and need to in push. As well. Yeah, that that felt a bit of a a ball drop from them. I mean, if they said if they said normal outlap, fair, but I just feel it was like... worse to that effect. I'll let them off then. In that scenario, yeah, normally, like you come out of the pits and it'd be like you are racing so and so. Yeah, push, push, push. Yeah, you know, you need that information. Like, otherwise, you're gonna try and save the tires. For when yeah. you need them, yeah. I mean, in a race like this. he's still, yeah. regardless of whose fault it is, it's still a WTF that should have just have an honourable. Yeah, mate, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, you can have that. Right, is that it? Is that we done? I think we might yeah, be done. I think so. Everyone done with the answer to that one? Yep. I think so. Fair enough. Right. Um, if you want to get in touch with us in general, you can head to Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and just find us on all the normal social medias there. You can go to. Um, Backward.com, there's a contact form as well there. And of course, if you are watching this on YouTube, you can use the comment section below. And please do remember to hit the like, hit the subscribe, and be here part of it every single week. Speaking of being here every single week, we'll be back next week and we're going to be looking forward to the Canadian GP. Um, and if you want to get involved with us live, you can always head to patreon.com forward slash back of the grid where there's all the information for getting involved with our Discord where you can hear the episodes live and get involved with us in between races. So that is it for this week. So thanks to everyone who's been here and we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.